All right, everybody, this video is gonna help walk you through your notes on chapter 1.5, The Origin of Cells. Okay, so let's walk back and do a quick review of the cell theory. Again, if I were you, I would be prepared to list the three parts of the cell theory, um, along with evidence to support each one, but here goes it. All organisms are made of one or more cells. Cells are the smallest units of life, and all cells come from pre-existing cells. Okay, now in class, we're gonna walk through a video to kind of help you understand the concept of this word theory. Okay, but for now, okay, we can kind of use this definition to complete our notes. So what is a theory? Well, a theory is a well-substantiated explanation. Okay, so first of all, it explains something acquired through the scientific method and repeatedly tested and confirmed, okay? So this is not something that we're just guessing at. This is not something that we're like kind of sure about. It's something that explains some kind of natural phenomenon and it's been tested and very well supported through lots and lots and lots of scientific uh, evidence. Now, I can assume the reason that you're taking biology instead of chemistry or physics is because you love talking about these things, exceptions. So in biology, we have like well understood patterns, but there are always exceptions or what appear to be exceptions to these patterns or rules. So when we talked about the cell theory um, back in a previous chapter, we said that there are two examples that you should really be aware of. These striated muscle cells with each cell having multiple nuclei, it kind of acts as like a cell within a cell. Kind of, so kind of bust open that part of the cell theory that says cells are the basic units of life, right? And then we have these aseptate fungal hyphae, okay? So here we have like what appear to be cells, but they don't have septa, they don't have boundaries, right? So again, kind of like acting of within uh, cells within a cell. But my point here is that even though there are uh, slight exceptions, this theory that all living things are made of cells, cells are the basic units of life, and new cells come from old cells, uh, still holds true. Okay, so these first two, okay, all organisms are made of cells, cells are the smallest units of life, um, really came about when we uh, advanced in the world of microscopy and then used those microscopes for careful observation. Number three, new cells come from pre-existing cells, uh, came about in a little bit different way. You see, back in the day, People used to believe in this idea of spontaneous generation, okay? So generation meaning to make or to come about. Spontaneous means like without rhyme or reason, right? So this is legit. You can look this up on the internet. I'm not making this up. Way back in the day, people used to believe that small things like mice, bacteria, insects, uh, came out of nowhere. And I can understand their thinking, right? Because some of these things produce offspring that are too small for us to see. So by the time we could see them, they were already adults and it kind of looked like they came from nowhere. So they thought that mice came from dirty clothes that had food on it that had been left around for too long and that this dirty clothes spontaneously gave birth almost to these baby mice. Well, this was widely accepted well into the 19th century. So we're talking the 1800s, not that long ago. And thankfully uh, for us, along comes one of the great heroes of biology, Louise Pasteur, who to me looks like some kind of mashup between Ulysses S. Grant and Bradley Cooper, but I've digressed. Okay, so Pasteur was saying, Look, you dummies, okay? Things don't just grow out of nowhere, okay? They are the product of their parents, right? They're some sort of offspring. And so how did he go on to prove this? Well, what he did is he took two flasks and he filled them up with chicken broth, okay? Uh, and then he boiled them. So when he boiled them, what he was doing is killing all of the bacteria that might have been present in there to begin with. 
He left one of them open to the environment, and he put this fancy neck on here because he's French and fancy. And that fancy neck allowed it to kind of be closed, right? So there was no interaction between the outside environment and the broth in this one. All right, so we were starting out with two broths that were totally sterile, free of any kind of bacteria. And he left them for a couple of weeks. And what he noticed is that the one that was closed to the environment had no bacterial growth. And the one that was open to the environment had bacterial growth. So what this showed is it must have been something in the environment okay, that was entering this broth and causing bacterial growth. And so he proposed that there were bacteria in the environment making their way into the flask and then growing and reproducing, okay? So therefore, he showed that new cells can only come from pre-existing cells. This is also, by the way, where we get the term pasteurized milk, killing off of the bacteria that's present in milk. And holy cow, I'm sorry for that noise. Someone is mowing their lawn right next to their to my window. But anyways, you get the point there. Okay, so Pasteur's experiments were revolutionary, right? Proving that all living cells come from pre-existing cells, which was remarkable for his time. So the problem is, is that it doesn't explain how we get back to that very first cell. Okay, so where did the very first cell on Earth come from? Well, that's something that Pasteur couldn't really explain at the time. We now have tons of scientific evidence that kind of promote the idea that organic molecules like amino acids, DNA, etc. can be synthesized from inorganic molecules and that process was really likely in early Earth. Okay, we're going to talk about organic molecules uh, in chapter two. Um, but what you need to know for, uh, for right now is that early Earth was kind of a gnarly place. Okay, a lot of volatile gases in the atmosphere, a lot of lightning and other kind of crazy things going on. And so what we think happened is that some of those volatile gases and compounds in the atmosphere and in the oceans reacted with this constant influx of energy to produce parts of living things like amino acids and DNA. And that eventually those organic molecules kind of came together to form the first cell. Okay, now we've actually been able to replicate this process in a laboratory setting, which is kind of awesome and amazing. I'll show you more of that in class. Um, so what you need to understand is that that process is possible. You also need to know that that doesn't happen anymore. Earth is like a kinder, more gentler place now. Okay, these processes aren't happening anymore. And that now we're like 100% certain, or I guess as certain as we can be in the scientific community, that this process of uh, generating cells from pieces and parts no longer happens, okay? That in the present day, uh, pre-existing cells give rise to new cells, and that's the only way that they can come about. So let's talk about that first cell, okay? We believe that that first cell was a prokaryotic cell. So again, we're talking about a membrane surrounded by a cell wall, We've got some kind of nucleoid region with one circular chromosome. We've got some ribosomes, maybe some pili, maybe a flagella, okay? Now, how do I know it was prokaryotic instead of eukaryotic? Well, because prokaryotes are most, more simple, so it's easier to kind of believe that a simple cell was the first cell and not some crazy complex cell. Um, and also, we're going to talk about how eukaryotes came about in just a moment. So you're, for right now, you're just going to have to take my word that the first cell was probably a prokaryotic cell. Now, we say all living things came from this one original type of cell, but how do I know that? Well, first of all, all living things perform the same functions. Remember that Mrs. Grin uh, mnemonic device for the characteristics of life? You know, all those things like metabolism, growth, excretion, nutrition, etc. 
Okay, so it's kind of weird that all living things can do all those things, right? We all have that in common. But I think probably the coolest and most compelling piece of evidence is our DNA. All cells, it does not matter what kind of cell you're talking about, a human, a tree, a slug, a bacteria, it doesn't matter. We all have DNA that is virtually identical, okay? Two strands made up of sugars and phosphates in the backbone. You should know that from your first biology class, but don't worry if you don't. We'll be talking a lot about that later, okay? And then in the middle here, these latter pieces, right, are made up of codes, A's, T's, G's, and C's, these nitrogenous bases that make up the codes. All living things have the same four bases, A's, T's, G's, and C's. The only thing differentiating you from a slug is the pattern of your A's, T's, G's, and C's. But it's pretty amazing when you think about all living things having the same molecule with the same structure, which makes the same uh, product. Your DNA is just a set of instructions for making polypeptides or proteins. And what's interesting is that this code for DNA is universal. So the same codes that are in your DNA making this amino acid, okay, uh, hold true for other organisms. So if this same code is found in another organism, it still makes this amino acid. And the only way to scientifically explain that is if we all came from the same common ancestor. So that kind of explains how prokaryotes uh, came about. What about eukaryotes? So humans, other animals, plants, fungi, uh, protists, we're all made of eukaryotic cells. And we have a really cool explanation for how this came about. And I love this one because it was discovered by a woman. So let's give her a little credit back in the 80s. I'm a woman of the 80s, so I take great interest uh, in this. There's some really cool videos that we're going to watch in class. Um, but for now, you just kind of need to know how this process works. So here's the actual process that we believe took place resulting in eukaryotic cells. So we think that at about 2 billion years ago, okay, some kind of eukaryotic cell, like a really primitive eukaryotic cell, engulfed some kind of heterotrophic bacteria. So one point for you, if you can name this process of engulfing, I'm going to pause, pause, pause while you're thinking. Okay, this is called phagocytosis. And it is a type of endocytosis. So if you got that right, awesome. Pause this, go get yourself a brownie and celebrate. Okay, so we thought that a eukaryotic cell kind of engulfed a heterotrophic bacteria. All right, well, heterotrophic. That means that it's eating its food for energy. Okay. We think that then this eukaryotes and this uh, heterotrophic bacteria that it consumed formed comes some kind of symbiotic relationship. So symbiotic meaning they're both benefiting. Okay, so how are they both benefiting? Well, this prokaryote gets a home. It gets this nice, cushy, nice environment full of plenty of like water and solutes and other awesome things. In turn, this eukaryotic cell was probably stealing some of the energy from this heterotrophic cell. It was probably making this heterotrophic eukaryote do all of the conversion uh, for its energy, like taking all of the food energy and converting it into energy in the form of ATP. Okay, so this is kind of like, I don't know, some kind of traditional marriage from like back 300 years ago. Okay, sure, you can come into my house if you make all my food. Okay, something like that. All right, over time, and I don't mean a week, I mean like millions of years, okay, we think that this bacterial cell in here underwent slight changes to eventually become a mitochondria. Okay, and I know it had to become a mitochondria because it's a heterotroph, right? It's converting food energy to energy in the form of ATP. All right, this came to be known as the endosymbiotic 
theory. Again, know your uh, prefixes here. Indo, like endocytosis, talking about inside the cell. Symbiosis, some kind of mutually beneficial relationship. So the way that eukaryotes came about is through the endosymbiotic theory. Two things living together, one inside the other. We think this is also the same for chloroplasts. So you might want to make a note of this here. Make sure you have this part. Make sure you understand that chloroplast came about the same way, but instead of from heterotrophic bacteria, probably through some kind of photosynthetic bacteria. Are you believing me yet, or is this sounding like completely like nut job crazy? All right, well, you're going to be asked to provide a lot of evidence for the endosymbiotic theory, okay? Just like you're going to ask me to provide evidence to you too, because this sounds nuts. All right, well, be careful. A lot of students, when asked to provide evidence for this theory, they talk about how mitochondria and chloroplasts are similar. That is not what you want to do, okay? If I told you, and this is incorrect, but if I told you that humans evolved from flowers, okay, first of all, I'd probably be fired, but second of all, you would be asking me, okay, well, prove it. What do humans and flowers both have in common? Well, if we're saying that mitochondria and chloroplasts came from prokaryotes, you need to list evidence of how these guys and these guys are similar. So what do they have in common? Well, mitochondria and chloroplasts, first of all, they're about the same size as prokaryotes. They both divide by a process called binary fission. So that's where you kind of like make a copy of the loop of DNA and then you kind of separate. Guess who else does that? Oh yeah, our friend prokaryotes. Mitochondria and chloroplasts both have their own DNA, and it's in a circular loop, just like prokaryotes. Notice that I keep referring back to prokaryotes. And I'll give you one hint here. Do you think that the DNA in a mitochondria and a chloroplast have histone proteins or no? Well, if you said no histones, you would be correct, and I love and adore you forever, because just like prokaryotes, they have naked DNA, not surrounded by histone proteins. And it just occurred to me that maybe you don't know what histone proteins are. Just write that down. You'll know someday. All right, so mitochondria and chloroplasts, they have their own ribosomes. So are you noticing that mitochondria and chloroplasts are like their own little kind of like country within a country. They're like the Vatican of cells, okay? They're really autonomous. They have all their own junk. They have DNA, they have ribosomes, they do their own division. They're kind of crazy, okay? So they have 70S ribosomes, just like prokaryotes. The rest of the eukaryotic cell is also going to have ribosomes, but these are 80S ribosomes. They're bigger, they're different. Okay, they also have a double membrane. So remember when they were engulfed, okay, they already had their own membrane. And then when the cell kind of wrapped them up in a vesicle, the vesicle part became a double membrane around them. Okay, so they have a double membrane. We'll talk more about their structures in particular in later chapters. All right, and finally, wow, I just realized there's two number fives here. Awesome, let's make this one number six. Okay, the genes of, uh, in, that we're finding in mitochondria and chloroplast are much more similar to prokaryotes than they are to the rest of your eukaryotic DNA. So quite a lot of evidence to support that these guys originated from prokaryotic cells. Okay, so if you're still a skeptic and you're still finding this hard to believe that eukaryotes kind of like swallowed up and used prokaryotes to make them do things, let me tell you about a real life example that's still kind of having a similar relationship here. There's a super cool slug, yep, slugs can be cool, called Alicia chlorotica, which is probably sounding way sexier than it actually is. In its juvenile form, it's brown and kind of ugly, 
Okay, and it works super hard feeding on a bunch of algae. So it's running around like crazy, sucking up as much algae as it can. But it's super careful, right? It doesn't just digest all of those algae cells and then pass it out and it's poop. It's able to retain those chloroplasts. Okay, so within the algae cells are green chloroplasts. And what this slug does is it kind of takes the chloroplasts and it saves them. So it takes these chloroplasts and it puts them in the bank. Okay, it kind of like saves them in its skin cells. Over time, this slug can accumulate so many chloroplasts in its skin cells that it doesn't have to move and look for food the rest of its life. It basically creates little slaves of these chloroplasts and these chloroplasts undergo photosynthesis. So they take energy from the sun and they convert it into glucose or food energy, which the slug then eats. Okay, so this slug is kind of saving and using chloroplasts much in the same way that those early eukaryotic cells used those photosynthetic prokaryotes. So cool. Fun fact here, uh, why is it shaped like this? So um, many people might be tempted to think that it's shaped like this so that it looks like a leaf so that no one eats it. There may be something to that, but I'm kind of more in line with the thinking of it's probably now in its adult form, got this flattened out shape to increase surface area, okay, so that more of its chloroplasts are exposed to the sunlight. So super duper cool. All right, that'll do it for chapter 1.5 on the origins of cells.